Hey guys, there's been a lot of anti-low carb talk in the past couple of years, increasingly perhaps, and um, I'm always sent these studies that take the stance that low carb might be problematic. And here's one of the latest ones, and it seems to be a centerpiece for a new campaign against traditional ancestral foods and towards grains and other high carby stuff. So I'm going to run through it briefly today and give people an idea of what's actually in the study. And as you can see, it suggested both high and low percentages of carbohydrate diets were associated with increased mortality. Well, the first thing to know is this is an associational study, also called an epidemiological study, and it's a correlation study and bears very, very little relation to causality or what actually causes problems. Epidemiology associational data. Let's take a quick look. So yellow fingers can be observed to correlate or link most strongly to the rates of lung cancer. That seems to be one of the strongest correlations you'll ever see in an associational study. Very impressive. But luckily we know it's the smoking that drives the higher rates of lung cancer. And the smoking, in turn, causes yellow fingers, and that gifts the yellow fingers with an extraordinarily powerful correlation with the rates of lung cancer. So that's a simple example, but we're not going to go scrubbing our fingers in order to avoid a cancer diagnosis, uh, quite obviously. Here's another one from Professor John Yudkin, who campaigned against sugar and heart disease back in the 60s, and he made the point that the increase in radio licenses correlated or associated most strongly with cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. In fact, it was a stronger correlation than anything else at the time, pretty much. But we know that the radio licenses just keep track with societal and industrial progress. And all of these drivers of heart disease were rising in lockstep, pretty much, with the increasing number of licenses. So this progress in society, so to speak, was linked strongly to the radio licenses, and they in turn thus were linked strongly to the rate of heart disease. But we know it's a spurious link. We're not going to switch off our radios to avoid the big one. So these are obvious examples, just to make the point. But one of the big problems here, and what makes these studies often near worthless, is the phenomenon of confounding. And you can see that the real causes of heart disease were confounded with the radio, licensing and smoking is confounded with the yellow fingers that result from it and it all makes the causal links kind of meaningless if you don't fully understand what's going on. One of the worst types of confounding in nutritional studies is healthy user bias and I'll explain that briefly uh, in a short while. So you can look at the graph from these studies and it shows the risk ratio for disease and quite simply Here's an irrelevant factor, and it has a risk ratio of 1. Whether this factor is high or low, you have 1 times the rate of disease likely. In other words, it doesn't affect the rate of disease. As you have a risk ratio going lower down the graph, it becomes a stronger and stronger correlation or association. It still doesn't mean it's causal. So we could have a factor here that, when it's in a bad place, or in a good place, you have around 35% lower chance of disease or death. But this could easily be an irrelevant factor because it's only an association. And that's actually quite a weak association in general terms. So we'll use a traffic light system now and we'll show that any associations up in this area are very weak and don't even have a whiff of causality about them or even hint at it. Down here, if you've got a very big risk reduction associated with a factor down in this zone, you know, you can begin to think of causality possibly, but you still need to go and do all the work to find out with a real experiment whether or not it's causal or confounded. And if you have a very strong uh, reduction in risk associated with a factor or down here in the green, you can be pretty sure you can make a good argument that it's very likely causal.
And smoking and lung cancer is an example like that. 20 times the rate approximately in smokers or around 95% lower in a non-smoker than a smoker. So this is strong. Another recent example from a study out uh, not too long ago was a Colombian study on men who had heart attacks and looking at them over the following years to see would they have a second one and what factors were strongly linked or associated with the second heart attack. And insulin stood out head and shoulders above everything else. And here you had around an 80% plus reduction in risk of a second heart attack if your insulin was on the low end of the scale. Which makes sense because it agrees with all of the metabolic signs, the insulin dysregulation, glucose dysregulation, intimately linked mechanistically to heart attacks. So this makes sense in every way and a strong correlation. What about the red meat and cancer scare recently from the WHO? Now they pretty much exclusively used associational data to come out with their indication that red meat could cause cancer possibly cause. (laughs) They were careful with the wording. But what was their risk ratio? Was it strong? Well, no. It was right up at the tip top of the red zone. All right, so you got to be really careful with these kind of media broadcasts. And the study we're looking at today, carbohydrate and mortality. So did they get a strong risk ratio, right? That was very impressive on its own, even with no proper experimental or other data. Well, no, it's around 20% reduction, roughly speaking, um, right in the red zone. So huge pinch of salt immediately required. Looking a little closer at the study data, and these are approximate figures or medians of the five different groups of varying carbohydrate intake. We've got what they would suppose is quite high up here, all the way down to what would be the very lowest fifth of the population. Now, as you can see, oh, hold on a minute. This is not a low carbohydrate diet. A low carbohydrate diet is very well put together and is generally around 20% carbohydrate or even much lower. And it is very important to carefully do a low carbohydrate diet at the right level uh, because if you're up at 37 or 40% of carbohydrate, then eating lots of even healthy fats, that combination is not ideal. So, This is not a low carb diet, obviously. The other thing to note is that none of these people actually went on a diet, well formulated or otherwise. These people just filled in a couple of questionnaires 25 years ago on what they seemed to be eating at the time, as they could recall. Uh, This is no experiment. This is just associational. So we're going to talk now a little about healthy user bias. And the situation when this study was started back in the 80s uh, and into the early 90s when they filled out the questionnaires, all the people were hearing a lot of messages about what was healthy and what would give you longevity and lack of disease. And it was megaphone stuff from all the authorities. And what it was, was this kind of thing. Lower fat, more plants, whole grains, base of the food pyramid, complex carbs, get them up get them up, more vegetables, less meat and fats and eggs and all those things. So this was the clarion call to the people. And what did the people do? Well, it depends on the individual. The individuals who chose to disregard the advice and couldn't care less went ahead and didn't go to higher complex carbs. They just ate whatever they wanted. And they would naturally be biased, those types of people, into the lower carbohydrate segment. And they would have much more unhealthy behaviors in general because they don't care about health advice, generally. The people who would heed the advice carefully, they would have healthy behaviors way beyond their diet. They're health focused and they would end up more represented in the higher carb and lower fat because they listen and they care a lot. And this is the healthy user bias. You can't possibly correct for this insidious effect that occurs in these associational studies, especially if the effect sizes are small, this will create noise that you can never correct for, even though they attempt to, it's, it's just not possible. So healthy user bias, let's look again at the study results. And these people down here on lower carbohydrate diets, so-called, 
was there anything else different about them? Could the healthy user bias be at play here? Well, there were many, many more smokers in this group than the other group at the high carb end, nearly 70% versus just over 50%. Exercise was statistically significantly lower in this group. There was a higher rate of type 2 diabetes in this group, Fascinating that when low-carb proper interventions in myriad human trials are showing dramatic reduction of diabetic physiology, and I'll touch on that at the end. So this is clearly a massive warning bell. Were these people, in general, many of them eating this kind of low-carb diet, high fat? This is the problem. So the healthy user bias alone, and there are many other problems, could take this data and apparent trend and easily, we don't know where it really is, but easily it could do things like this if you could fully, properly correct for it. And you could get a very different trend. But the effect sizes are so small in any case that we're dealing here in the world of noise. So there are many other reasons why this paper, you cannot change anything in your life based on it. Uh, one is, extra one is food frequency questionnaires. So these people in the late 80s and early 90s, just twice, put down on sheets like this what they thought they ate in the previous period. And that was it then. Everyone walked away for 20 years and came back to see how they were doing 20 years later. So... There are publications on the serious problems with this methodology. In general, observational studies are causing an enormous problem in the world. A huge percentage of observational study outcomes are not replicated when you actually do an experiment and you do the proper science. Right? So this paper is a good one to read, which touches on many of the issues. So a terrible track record there with many, many big mistakes when observational data turned out to not at all be what it seemed to be, for the reasons I've described and more. The other thing is, of course, it makes no evolutionary sense. We evolved as hunter-gatherers. In Northern Europe, for hundreds of thousands of years, there was very little carb. Our machines are designed around certain diets. It makes no sense that being slightly lower in carbohydrate, right, would have an impact on mortality. Uh, quite the opposite. And most importantly, there are many, many human trials and real mechanistic science which show lowering carbohydrate, particularly refined carbs and sugars, can have huge benefits, especially for people with metabolic disease. So Verta's clinical trial I'm showing here is just one of the most recent, and it's published peer-reviewed, and you can see there the dramatic improvements in so many biomarkers of health. And these people were type 2 diabetic, uh, but they're a great test case for the inherent health of an approach. And Verta used a very low-carb ketogenic approach, which of course was properly formulated and was an intervention, not an associational study. This is the real deal. But the work of professors Volokh and Finney as well, and countless other great researchers doing lower carb, healthy fat diets in humans, are showing across the board pretty much improvements in all metabolic biomarkers. And you may think, well, trials on people who have a diabetes issue or diabetic physiology, that's not the same as a diet tried on a normal, healthy human. But the latest figures from the U.S. show that nearly 65% of over 45s are now essentially diabetic using their blood glucose measures alone, probably higher if you used insulin measures. So the majority of adults over 45, by a considerable margin, now have diabetic physiology. So the broad diets we should be recommending should actually... <laughs> in general, be for the people who really need to change their diet because they have issues. And as I say, the majority at this point in the US. So I could go on, uh, but people who know me know I really don't like talking. So I think I'll wrap it up there. But don't forget to um, subscribe if you want more science and interpretation of scientific papers that are in the media. And indeed, many other topics around metabolic health demystified and explained. The book's there as well if you want to get the full lowdown on achieving health and longevity. 
And if you want to see a fantastic movie, you can click over on the right and it will tell you how to get the ultimate test for cardiovascular disease extent and maybe get the wake up call you need and enable you to know your score and to save your own life with the appropriate interventions. Thank you.